Hi, this is uh, Richard Hall here from uh, Stonehenge Artiella and we're going to be looking at the night sky and uh, for those of you watching on TV uh, you see a lovely lady out there that's uh, Andromeda and I'm going to be talking about her a little bit later on but looking at our night sky well even before looking at the night sky if you uh, get there nice and early oh I always forget this <laughs> Thanks to Dan Broughton for uh, sponsoring this program. You always got to remember Dan. Now, uh, in looking in the daytime, I guess most of you have probably seen that brilliant star in the uh, western evening sky just after sundown. Right? So it's the brightest thing you can see in the sky after the sun's disappeared. Right? Um, but that's no star. There's actually a second one that's also so bright that you can see it in the blue sky before the other stars appear. And neither of these, incidentally, are stars. They're both planets. The brightest one, of course, is the, what is normally known as the evening star, is the planet Venus. And we talked about Venus recently. It's, it's closer to the sun than the Earth. And consequently, uh, even in uh, a small telescope, you sh it shows phases just the same way as the, um, the moon does. And also, right now, it's about a half, like first quarter, as it were, of Venus. So that's the brilliant planet Venus. And the other bright object in our sky at that time is the planet Jupiter which is, of course, the biggest uh, planet in the solar system. Venus, incidentally, comes closer to us than uh, any other world uh, apart from the moon. Jupiter, of course, is absolutely enormous. You'd fit something like 1,300 Earths inside of that. And it's, in many ways, it's more like the sun than it is the uh, a planet. It's uh, what people often call a gas giant, but it's actually mostly composed of liquid, liquid hydrogen and so on. And even in a small pair of binoculars, once it begins to get dark, you'll be able to see at least four of the um, bright moons. Jupiter has got something in the region of 70-odd moons, all right? four of which are, 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 are like little planets, and uh, they can be seen with a, a pair of binoculars. But that's what you can see while the sky is still blue. All right? Now, However, if we could imagine that we could just turn the the, uh, the sun off, as it were, and have a look at the background stars that we were looking up, up there, we see Venus and Jupiter up there, and um, there's another planet there as well. In between Venus and Jupiter is another star. It doesn't stand out like Venus and Jupiter because it is a bright star, but it's no brighter than many of the other big bright stars around. Well, both Venus and Jupiter outshine all other stars. Well, the other object, of course, is the planet Saturn, uh, which is, of course, one of the most magnificent objects to observe uh, through a telescope. And like Jupiter, it's a world entirely different from that of the Earth. It also is what we call a gas giant, and it's got vast numbers of moons and so on orbiting around it. So, and incidentally, uh, although we always talk about the rings of Saturn, which appear to be probably the disintegrated remains of uh, one or more moons that got too close to uh, Saturn. Jupiter's also got uh, uh, rings, uh, but they're not, uh, you can't see, uh, we didn't know about them until we sent a spacecraft out there because they're nowhere near as bright as those that we can see in Saturn. But anyway, that's what you get in the early evening, you'll see, you'll see Venus and, and then Jupiter and look in between or close to Jupiter, you'll see the planet Saturn. But of course, by the time it gets um, dark, oh, the other thing I wanted to point out is which constellations are in, because initially you can't see them. Venus is in the constellation of Scorpius, and actually it's quite close to the big bright star Antares, which is one of the brightest stars in the sky, but it's not going to become really noticeable until it gets dark. And the other two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are in the constellation of Capricornus, right? So that's those two there. But of course, in actual fact, by the time it gets dark, uh, Venus is going to be getting close to the horizon. And for those of you watching it on uh, our TV, you've got an image of looking due south and you can see Venus and uh, uh, Antares are just about to set there. And if you look absolutely due south, you can see the Southern Cross, which at this time of the year is upside down near the horizon. 
All right, so for those of you watching this on TV, there is the Southern Cross there. And following behind that is the um, two pointer stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri. And of course, the brighter of the two, Alpha Centauri, is important to us because it's actually the nearest star beyond the solar system. All of the stars that you can see out there are actually distant suns. Right? Um, our sun is a star. Uh, and Alpha Centauri is the nearest star beyond the solar system, uh, and uh, it's what we—it's distance we measure in light time. It's uh, 4.3 light years away. Right? <clears throat> in other words, if you could travel at the speed of light, it would take you f just over four years to get to um, to get to um, uh, Alpha Centauri. You've got to remember that if you if you if you could travel that fast here on Earth, you could travel around the Earth in in a fraction of a second. All right. It would take you to the, to get to our sun at the speed of light. It would take you eight minutes. So we can say the sun is eight light minutes away. So it's worth remembering that when we look at the sun and what's happening on the sun, we're not seeing as it is right now. We're seeing it was eight minutes ago. In turn, when we look at the pointer stars, Alpha Centauri, we're seeing Alpha Centauri as it was more than four years ago. And if one day, which we may well happen one day, we will send a spacecraft out there with people on board, we, we virtually lose contact. It's not going to be like Star Wars at all. Because if you're out there around Alpha Centauri, you say, how, I have, how is everybody here on Earth? And it's because it's four years before that message gets here. And if you replied, another four years getting back. So it will be eight years before they got a reply. So the idea of having galactic empires and people better talking one another across the immensity of space is, is, is truly is science fiction. So that's Alpha Centauri in our bright sky. But the other thing to notice is that the Milky Way uh, is laying, appears to be laying along the horizon. So when you look towards the south on a nice clear dark night, you've got this pageant of stars laying along there and this these are very very important also uh, looking back into the history of this land here because those big bright stars and just for those of you watching on um, tv the two brightest stars in the sky are there as well and that's sirius which is the brightest star and canopus anything that's brighter than them is no is no star all right and the only one that's outshining is Venus and Jupiter at the moment. But this great pageant of stars that runs all the way along the horizon uh, actually represents a special constellation. And we'll bring it up now, and there it is. It's the great walker of Tamariri. Yeah. And this is the great ship in the sky. And at this time of the year, uh, we always do something special at... Um, at Stonehenge Artira, uh, and we do our own Matariki at that time. Yes, yes, there. And the reason is, if you to see Matariki and to see the great walker in the sky and the four posts in the sky and all the star stars to do with Maori legends and so on, well, you have to get up at dawn, uh, before dawn, in the middle of winter, all right, to see this occurring. And of course, all the time, the sky is gradually getting brighter as the sun's beginning to climb high in the sky. But those same stars, which we can see at the beginning of the Maori New Year, near midwinter, right, those same stars rise up in our spring sky right, in November. The difference is, of course, it's warmer, it's in the evening, but furthermore, it's gradually getting darker. And that gives us the opportunity to take you around the sky and learn not only where Matariki is and what it is and so on, but also the great walker in the sky, the posts in the sky, the house in the sky and so on. Because according to Māori legend, when we see the stars at that time, it's as it was at the time of creation. Right? So we've got a special evening coming up. And it's called Matariki Work of the Gods. And the prime presenter is going to be Kay Leather. Um, who also wrote, wrote the book Work of the Gods, and she's going to be taking you through all of the wonderful stories associated with Matariki, then hopefully we'll take you out so you can actually see the stars themselves. And that's all going to be starting at 7.30pm on Saturday, November the 6th, and that's going to be at Stonehenge Artira. So if you'd like to learn more about it, swoop onto our webpage or give Stonehenge a call. 
So that's Matariki that we've got coming up. In there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Anyway, returning to our night sky, looking south, of course, all the bright parts of the Milky Way are laying along the horizon. And as you look upwards, almost again looking due south, you will see what appears to be two detached portions of the Milky Way. They're quite noticeable, actually. Uh, but these are nothing to do with the Milky Way at all. See, the Milky Way, the, that light there, simply made up of vast numbers, millions of stars that lay in our galaxy that are too, each individually are too far away and too faint to be see, seen uh, individually. But we see them as a haze of light. But when we look up at the Magellanic clouds, they are also made of stars, but they do not belong to the, the, the Milky Way as such. Now, in exactly the same way as planets have moons, all right, big galaxies like our Milky Way galaxy, they also have satellites. And the two Magellanic clouds are, in fact, satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. And they're atta atta attached to it. And indeed, it is believed by many that giant galaxies uh, like our Milky Way galaxy have simply grown in size simply because they swallow up and devour all the smaller galaxies as around them as they move through space. Now let's have a look closer look. Uh, the largest, of course, the large Magellanic cloud. Uh, you can have a, a good look at this for a pair of binoculars, but in a um, telescope, this is absolutely magnificent uh, because for the first time you're actually able to explore a galaxy in its entirety. So we uh, have this like a bar, almost what, I guess a large cloud is almost like what we would call a barred spiral, which incidentally is exactly what our Milky Way galaxy is. But even with a small t telescope, you'll pick up patches of light and one of them stands out above all the others. I'll just bring that up there. And it, by putting in the contrast, you can begin to see, for those of you watching on TV, the different main structures in the large cloud. So let's have a closer look at this. All right? Number one is a big bright piece at the top. That is the Tarantula Nebula. And it is, in fact, the biggest star-forming region in this region of space. It completely outshines anything else in... Um, in our galaxy. Now, when we're looking at the tarantula, I said a little while ago, Alpha Centauri was what, um, four light years away. Well, a tarantula nebula, to give it some scale, is 169,000 light years away. So this tells you straight away, the fact that you can see this in a pair of binoculars, this object is absolutely huge. And at the centre of the nebula, illuminating, the nebula is simply gas and dust, which is being illuminated. There is a, a central star cluster. But this is no ordinary star cluster. Many of these stars inside here are the biggest and brightest stars in the known universe. Many of them more than a million times brighter than the sun. And indeed, because they are so bright and so energetic, um, they don't live very long. You see, the trouble is, when, when you, if you were to double the mass of our sun, it wouldn't be suddenly twice as bright. Right? It would be something like eight times brighter. So the more mass, the hotter the interior and the brighter it gets. So these stars, which are a million times brighter than the sun, whereas our sun lasts for billions of years, these only last for a few thousands or millions of years. So any time now, one of these stars will end its life, and when it does so, it will explode in a violent explosion, which we call a supernova or even a hypernova. And you'll know when it occurs because you'll see this as a big bright star in the sky buried into the, uh, the tar tarantula nebula out there. So this is quite an amazing cluster, a cluster of literally millions upon millions of stars, but many of them millions of times brighter than our own sun. So absolutely fabulous object. Now, if you ever get the opportunity, do come along and have a look at these wonderful things for a telescope. So that's that's the large cloud. The other one up there is the small Magellanic cloud. And when, when we look at the small cloud, 
one of the things we notice is it, it's almost got like a, a tadpole sh- uh, shape. And a little earlier I was mentioning the fact that we believe that uh, big galaxies like our own grow in huge size since because they swallow up any other galaxies. Well, we now know that not just the two Magellanic clouds, our galaxy has got something like a dozen satellite galaxies, which is gradually absorbing. And you can see how with the small Magellanic cloud, it's got this tadpole appearance that it's actually been drawn towards the, the Milky Way galaxy. So with the passage of time, it will be broken up and its stars will simply become part of the Milky Way galaxy. So that's a small cloud. And as I said, you can see these on a dark night with the unaided eye. And you can, of course, you see a lot more with uh, binoculars and, of course, with a telescope. But there's something else that's very, very interesting there in our sky, quite close. Once you've identified the um, this two clouds, look closely to next to the uh, small cloud. And you will see, but you'll be very noticeable with uh, binoculars, is a fuzzy star. And in fact, this star was named way back in the 19th century as 47 Tucanae. Now, it's called that because it is in the constellation of Tucanae, the Toucan. But also, it was classed as the 47th brightest star in the constellation of Toucan. But 47 Tucani is no star. And indeed, when people began to observe this thing thing for a telescope, they'd made an awesome discovery. No star at all. So let's bring it up for those of you watching this on TV. This is what 47 Tucani really looks like. It's a gigantic cluster of stars. Um, And I mean gigantic. It's got a diameter of about 300 light years. Um, and, it, and it contains up to a million stars. So this is a titanic cluster and it's spherical and it gets brighter and brighter to the centre. Absolutely magnificent object to look at on a neat sky. But there's something else that's really interested about things like 47 Tucana. They've begun to be, belong to a class of objects we call globular clusters. And we find them in a halo surrounding the galaxy. And what they are, actually, are the remnants, the bits and pieces, the bricks that were left over from the formation of our Milky Way galaxy. In fact, the stars of globular clusters are exceedingly old. They're as old as the oldest stars in the galaxy. And this one here in 47 Tucane, right, it's over, the stars there are around about 11 to 12 billion years in age, right? which is more than double the age of our sun. So this is an ancient star, um, a system of ancient stars. And of course, astronomers are really interested in looking at this because we're able to uh, see what things were like thousands of years ago. Now, 47 Tucani is, has a distance of 17,000 light years. Right. So when we see it, we're seeing it as it was 17,000 thousand years ago you see we never see the universe as it is the further we look into space the further backwards in time we look so we see the universe as it was right now we need to think about that near the center there imagine being on a planet near the center of that cluster you see here in the our vicinity of space stars are separated by about four or five light years but at the center of that cluster the Clark stars are packed together and they're just a few light minutes or light weeks away. So if you were standing on a planet in the, near the middle of that uh, cluster, you would have literally hundreds upon hundreds of stars which were brighter than the full moon. There will be thousands and thousands of stars brighter than any other star. The star, that entire heavens, would just be a mass of brilliant stars. So a sort of view that we just can't imagine what it would be like here on Earth. But remember again, when we're looking at it, we're seeing it as it was. When that light, when we look at um, 47 Tucani, the light coming from those stars, which forms the image we can see, started on its journey when we were in the midst of the last ice age. If you want to turn this around, this means if you... 
there was somebody out on 47 Tucani with a telescope and they were looking down here towards our solar system. And they had a telescope big enough they could see the Earth. They wouldn't see us. Uh, they would be seeing woolly mammoths and so on because they would see the Earth and the solar system as it was 17,000 years ago. Right. So that's 47 Tucani up there in the sky. Now, we swing round to the north a little bit <coughs> have a look at the stars. As I said, the Milky Way is laying along the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's laying along the southern horizon. And when we look out north, we don't see any brilliant Milky Way. But what is very noticeable in the patterns is almost directly north is what we call the Great Square. And although they're made up of fairly bright stars, they sort of stand out, right? This is the great square in the sky. In fact, it's called the great squ uh, square of Pegasus because it's in the constellation of uh, Pegasus. But what I wanted to bring to your attention was the line of stars running from the bottom right star of the um, great square, running towards the horizon diagonally. Right? And this forms the constellation of Andromeda. That runs down there. Uh, remember, we were looking at Andromeda earlier. Uh, and uh, some of you may know the stories of Andromeda, who was chained to a rock and uh, was eventually um, managed to uh, get her, her lover, Perseus, managed to uh, save her from the, the sea monster. That's Andromeda up there. But the lovely thing about Andromeda, as far as astronomers are concerned, is on the chain that runs down, which is cha a chain in the sky. Here is the most distant object that can be seen with the unaided eye. That is, without a telescope, here we find the most distant object. So let's have a look for you, on those of you on TV. For those of you who can't, if you find the great square, just look to the right and below it. And on a, it has to be a nice dark night. You will see a hazy patch of light down there. All right? And uh, that's the great galaxy and in, in Andromeda, M31. And it is a spectacular spiral galaxy. In fact, it is a galaxy that's very, very similar to our own Milky Way galaxy. So if we were looking at our galaxy, it would look similar to that. And like our galaxy, um, M31 has got satellites as well, satellite galaxies. Uh, and you can see some of them there as well. So it is a huge spiral galaxy. And the discovery of this thing revolutionised our knowledge of the universe. See, up to that time, people going back into the 19th century, people thought there were stars and so on, and all the hazy patches of light that you could see out there were just clouds. And there's, there was only one thing in the universe, that was our galaxy. But what happened was with the building of a brand new telescope at Mount Palomar, 100 inch telescope, and they managed to look at this thing here, it resolved it into stars. What they realised that this elliptical patch of light was in fact a spiral galaxy seen almost edge on. Right? As I mentioned earlier, it is um, similar to the sun, but it is the most distant thing that you can see with the unaided eye. Because the distance to Andromeda right, is, in fact, over two million light years. So, in other words, it, take, it takes light like two point two million years to travel all the way there. Right, and um, so I want you, to, want you to think about that two point two million years. Well, the entire human history of our race is tied up in that. When you look at Andromeda Galaxy and you see the light coming from there, that started on its journey when our earliest ancestors were appearing in Africa two million years ago. Right? And I'll tell you something else that's interesting. Um, both the Andromeda Galaxy and our galaxy belong to a, a group of galaxies called the Local Group. And actually, M31 is heading towards us and will, in its pending passage, collide with the, the, our Milky Way galaxy. But don't worry about it at the moment. Uh, that two million light years, so far away at this stage, is going to take something like a billion years for it to actually get here. Right? 
but there's going to be a hell of a big bang in about a billion years from now when the M31 collides with our Milky Way. But I guess the most spectacular images we can imagine is seeing that just before um, that time um, when that Andromeda galaxy would fill the sky. It would be an absolutely awesome sky to be seen in the distant future here from our Milky Way galaxy. <coughs> now, going back to our northern sky, if you look along there, down to the right and then look into the south down down the southeast you'll see a brilliant cluster of stars and this cluster of stars is of course Matariki the Pleiades star cluster right? and this is what I was saying to you earlier at this time of the year in early no late October early November you can see all the stars right uh, which you could see at the beginning of the Māori New Year and as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be telling the stories of Matariki, uh, our Stonehenge. Uh, I won't go into details again. This is on November the 6th at 7.30pm. Uh, we're going to tell you all the stars, uh, both astronomically, but also the wonderful stories, stories from Mali and Polynesia and, and actually Europe about these stars. And then we're going to be taking you out to the uh, it's two Stonehenge and we'll stand out there and we'll pick out all these different stars which were important to Māori in the past. So that's on the 6th of November, 7.30pm. Do book in because it's also it's always good to make sure to get a place because numbers will be limited there. Okay, So that's on November the 6th. Finally, just to point out that uh, Stonehenge is now open from 10am uh, to 4pm from Wednesday to Sunday. Normally we've got Mondays and Tuesdays as off and uh, you can come up and do uh, self-guided tours in which you get a map of the stone circle, an audio visual and then wander around the stones and discover the uh, wonders of our ancestors. Right. So that's what we've got coming up in the not too distant future at Stonehenge. One final thing I should mention as we head towards Christmas. Ever wondered what the Christmas star was, the Star of Bethlehem? We're also going to be doing a special program on the Star of Bethlehem. Okay. Anyway, folks, that's that's us for me, the Stonehenge Artiara, and um, I'll be catching up with you again soon. Good day. You can't have a